Thank you all for being here for this uh, ninth and this semester last lecture by uh, the series Critical Issues in Public Art. My name is Trude Schellup Iversen, and together with Ruth Hege Halstensen, uh, I am responsible for the lecture series at Kuro that have included Jasmina Shibik, Meshlil Widrish, Paul O'Neill, Per Gunnar Egg Tverbak, Knut Ostam, Thomas Hitchhorn, Rosalind Deutsche, Marianne Heyer, and now we are very honored to have Claire Doherty as today's speaker, and uh, the lecture is a collaboration with Situations and Public Art Now. Not long after we launched the Critical Issues in Public Art, I saw with great interest this little book with the title The New Rules of Public Art, consisting of 12 new rules, not as something you should follow slavishly, but as a set of possible ways of uh, thinking, reflecting, and producing public art today. Some rules are classics already, like number one, it doesn't have to look like public art, and number two, it's not forever. My very own favorite is number six, demand more than fireworks, believe in the quiet, unexpected um, encounter, as much as the magic of the mass spectacle. So having the author among us today is with great pleasure. Many of you might know Dorothy's work through the important book From Studio to Situation from 2004. In addition to her curatorial work and as the founder of the research and international commissioning program Situations, based in Bristol. Claire Doherty is the Senior Research Fellow uh, in Fine Art at the University of West England, Bristol. She's also, the visit, she's also a visiting lec lecturer in curating at the Royal College of Art, London. I should also mention that this lecture is live streamed by This Is Tomorrow. Thank you, James Smith from This Is Tomorrow. And thank you to Kjartan Adal Nilsen from Kuru for organizing the technical parts of all the lectures in critical issues in public art. And now, Claire, warm welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Trude, so much for hosting me here on this incredibly beautiful afternoon. For those of you watching live stream, hello. Uh, you wouldn't believe how beautiful the sunshine is out there. So I'm amazed there's any audience at all in the room today. Um, but before we kick off, I would be really interested to know who you are. Um, and so I'm just going to ask um, a little bit about how you might define yourselves. So can I just ask how many people who would define themselves as artists in the room? Great, so huge majority. And how many as a curator or a producer? You can be both. Okay. <laughs> and how many funders or commissioners? One. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyone from the city, municipality at all? OK. That's very helpful. Thank you. Well, um, I wanted to start today's talk uh, by just sort of reminding ourselves maybe why we're here, which is that we all have an extraordinary passion for the work that artists do and for the idea, the impossible idea um, that emerges in the artist's imagination. This is a, a work by uh, two very, very young artists um, who did these series of brilliant posters all over the city of Bristol, which were provocations of what a public artwork could be. Uh, and in, in fact, this was a poster advertising a series of tattoos that they would um, tattoo the, the Bristol residents on with the word forever and that therefore these, uh, these uh, people would be walking public artworks for the rest of their lives. Um, but the reason I put that up is just this, this notion of new work is uh, at the heart of perhaps what many of us who are really committed to public art commissioning are about, in that we love that moment that the invitation comes through in the inbox, or maybe there's an advert for a public art commission, or maybe a little bit of funding becomes available, or maybe there's an anniversary or commemoration that demands a new public artwork. There's this sort of incredible moment, isn't there, of what might be possible. And then so often in our professional lifetimes, then come the crashing parameters 
and restrictions and difficulties and negotiations and challenges uh, of making that vision, that amazing work, happen. And perhaps in our lifetime there might be uh, just a few, three or four moments when all you dreamed of as an artist or all you dreamed of as a curator or a funder comes to fruition. So this talk is something about how those two things come together, how uh, the dream of uh, that first idea meets the reality of the situation or the context in which we all work, um, and perhaps some things that we need to renegotiate uh, in order to make more of those dreams happen. So I want to start with a story as we're talking about the imagination, a story uh, of something that happened to me, just as an example of, of how um, extraordinary ideas come to fruition. Um, I was standing in my kitchen about uh, three years ago, something like that, and the phone rang, and uh, it was a very dodgy line. It was very, I don't know if that translates in Norwegian, but it was a very bad line on the phone. And so all I could hear was this, <laughs> like that. I just, who the hell is that? And uh, after, after a bit more of that kind of disturbance, I heard, I realized it was wind, and someone was on the other line, and this voice came down the other line, and he said, it's Alex Hartley. Uh, I, I'm an artist, I met you, you may not remember. I said, of course I remember you, Alex. He said, I'm standing on a cliff top. And I said, oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, and he said, yeah, I've just had this idea. I've just had this idea. And he said, I've just imagined standing on this cliff top in the summer of the Olympics, when the Olympics come to Great Britain, and seeing an Arctic island arriving off the edge of a headland out to sea, being towed by a boat. I said, that sounds fantastic, Alex. Why are you ringing me on a Sunday morning to tell me this? And he said, well, um, because I've got this idea, there's this opportunity that's come up, so it's that, that moment when a bit of funding becomes available. And he said, there are 12 grants for artists of half a million pounds each to make extraordinary artworks in the public realm that somehow celebrate this moment of when the Olympics are coming to Great Britain um, and this is what I want to do. Now all I could remember about Alex's practice from the past was this work from 2004 when he uh, went on a Cape Farewell expedition. So Cape Farewell is a, you probably know, is a, a climate change organization dedicated to taking artists and musicians and choreographers to the high Arctic, to Svalbard at the time. Um, and uh, Alex went on one of those expeditions with people like Rachel Whiteweed and various other, Jarvis Cocker and various other musicians. And what struck me was that Alex's work seemed to be perhaps the only work that in some ways um, uh, really negotiated the kind of contested territory that Svalbard is. You know, many of the works coming back were quite literal in their representation of the Arctic and the high Arctic. Whereas Alex has dealt with the fact that that particular territory, as you know well, is highly contested politically. He was interested in finding an island that had emerged due to the melting glacier. So an island that effectively was not, was out of Norwegian jurisdiction because when Norway, uh, created that as this area as, the king, as part of the Kingdom of Norway, that land would not have been in existence. So here's Alex making this colonialist gesture of stepping onto the island, the first man to have stepped on the island. So that was my memory of his work, and I'm not going to go into huge details on this work, but I just want to give you a sense of how this appears in your mind. So many of the artists here sitting in the audience today, a curator will have in their minds their previous practice, the artist's previous practice, and this was the work that resulted over 10 years ago, which was a, a, a collection of all of the photographs and letters that amounted from that expedition where he tried to secede that island from the Norwegians. Uh, so it was a political act. And in fact, what Alex proposed to me was that for uh, that summer, for 2012, he would take the island, he would tow the island from Svalbard to the UK as a visiting island nation. And in doing so, it would become, go through international waters and be declared a new nation um, because it would 
essentially go through, come out of the jurisdiction of Norway. Now, of course, what immediately came to my mind was previous artistic precedents. So that process of uh, being curator in that way, kind of what starts to go through your head is what else, what other kind of associations can I make? And this is um, Robert Smithson's drawing from 1970 of his floating island, which was to take this sort of floating island park around the island of Manhattan, so an island around another island. And it, in fact, was, was made real in 2009, um, after, po posthumously. But uh, it also reminded me of that displacement of one material from another. So this was, this is a very blurry photograph, but I love this photograph. This is Michael Heitz's uh, this uh, levitated mass of this rock here was taken from the desert uh, on this huge journey and required this enormous articulated lorry going through Los Angeles and was then displaced as a permanent public artwork uh, just outside the uh, Los Angeles County Museum. So it immediately brought to mind those acts of displacement, and I'll mention later. Jonas Dahlberg's uh, proposition, of course, for Utoya is a very similar act of displacing land one place to another. But the reason I wanted to start with Alex's proposition to take this Arctic island and bring it to the UK is that this was to be done in the context, and context is all here, the context of the Cultural Olympiad. And at that point, the other public artworks that were being proposed for the Cultural Olympiad, which was the London 2012 celebration of uh, cultural program was this kind of proposition. This is the computer-generated image of Anish Kapoor's orbit uh, in the Olympic Park. So we knew that what we would, this work would be set against was the kind of either the monumentalism of these enormous public art commissions or the kind of this is a shot of a huge participatory project on the southwest coast in England, all these huge participatory projects where there was a lot of fireworks and celebrations. So how on earth <laughs> would a work uh, as, as conceptually rigorous and difficult, and logistically difficult as this, survive against that context? But it happened. This is Nowhere Island, as it was then titled. It did occur. We did displace the island from Svalbard. It was towed from Weymouth all the way around the southwest coast, 500 miles, and it took eight weeks. And in doing so, it visited ports and harbors along the way as a visiting island nation. Um, the project's very complex to talk about. It had so many different kinds of layers, both as this kind of barren island, this piece of landscape out to sea moving past another landscape. It was a sculptural form in one way, but it was also symbolic. It was a symbolic act. So it was an act in which that territory belonged to no one. It was a, a blank canvas. You could project your ideas about what a future nation might be. So you saw it both as this kind of territory moving through another territory. Here it is passing St. Michael's Mount and under the Bristol C Clifton Suspension Bridge. But it also became, unexpectedly in some ways, this huge participatory project that had a, a massive remote online audience as well as an audience on the ground. It attracted crowds to welcome it. It was accompanied by this embassy, this mobile museum that contained all of its histories, the story of where it came from. It also joined other kind of trade union marches. It, it, it joined activism. It became a symbolic political act. And I'll return to it in a little bit more detail in a minute. But I, what I wanted to give you a sense of was the way in which uh, an artist's idea, that idea on that cliff top, can become a public artwork which is dispersed in time and space. Now, at the end of its journey, Noah Island was broken up into very small pieces, and those small pieces were dispersed amongst people who had become citizens of Nowhere Island. And so it doesn't exist, but actually in memory, it exists as a very, very powerful public artwork in public memory, even though it's no longer a permanent piece of work. So this was a work that was produced by Situations. We're a small arts producer um, who are based in the city of Bristol, which is about an hour and a half from London. Um, but we work all over the world. 
and um, situations were set up in 2002. So over the last 12 years, we've seen this huge change in the field in which we all work in. Um, during that period of time, I would say one of the things that struck me the most is that um, working in public, in the field of public art, has no longer simply become about public space, about thinking about how artists work outside of the barriers of uh, or the boundaries of galleries and museums, but it's become about how artists work with public time. It's become about duration. It's become about an understanding of how artists infiltrate into our lives and to work directly with people. And I know in this series, you've had some fantastic speakers talking about Paul O'Neill, who worked with us for three years, talking about duration, talking about those projects that unfold over a series of time. You've had Thomas Hirschhorn, whose work is a touchstone for us in how it has uh, engages people in critical questions, but in doing so doesn't lose its integrity. And what we've seen is work such as this, which is Mike's, Mike Kelly, um, who's now uh, deceased, um, mobile homestead, his, his, his home uh, being moved from one place to another. We've seen Jeremy Deller's extraordinary work where he bought, brought a bombed out car across America with creative time and held a series of discussions around this extraordinary object. And these works encourage us to say, where is the work? What am I looking at? Is this the object? Is this the public artwork? Or is the conversation around it and what that leaves behind the work? We've seen work such as Paul Chan's restaging of Waiting for Godot in New Orleans. These places that have had profound changes, profound difficulties to negotiate. And what we've seen is that artists can provide creative solutions to that not necessarily providing consensus works which bring people together, but maybe artists that open things up so that a discussion can take place. We've seen works like Pavel Althammer's hilarious and brilliant Common Task project. I don't know if any of you know about this project, but essentially he took the residents of this small town in Poland. Uh, it's an ongoing project on a series of visits to other places, but always wearing these remarkable and hilarious gold suits thereby marking themselves out as alien. So forever in some ways being um, a visitor, an outsider, and being recognized as such. And during particularly the last couple of years, some of the things that I've seen really emerge, and we see this very much in, in the nature of future farmers projects and uh, here in Oslo. And this is the work of Theaster Gates in the south side of Chicago. Artists that understand the charismatic object, so this idea of this object that has a kind of, that draws you to it, perhaps that might be a building or architecture or a way, or a, a, a kind of quality of design that draws you to it in order to then uh, create a kind of social space for new things to happen. I think, uh, without going into too much detail, about a decade ago, there was a great deal of debate. I was in various debates with Claire Bishop around social engagement, socially engaged practice. And if you were to look through a series of books or go to a slide presentation around 2003, 2005, what you probably see is quite a lot of images of people sitting around having meals together. Um, and not a great deal of, uh, uh, quite, quite a sort of absence of visual pleasure, if you like. I think what we're beginning to see now is an understanding of actually how uh, the visual, a sense of design, uh, and, and those kinds of qualities are returning into this practice in the understanding that actually that participation can still take place, but there's something else needed to get people interested, to draw people to that site. And of course, at this time, we also see, this is um, the computer-generated image of Jonas Stalberg's proposal for the memorial, uh, artists uh, creating still profoundly uh, permanent epic uh, interventions into the landscape. So not everything that we see, we see happening is ephemeral, uh, in some ways nomadic, or uh, is highly temporary. But we still see this, the, the possibility of creating really quite substantial installations in sight. Now, all of these different kinds of ways of working, that's kind of like a rattling through of the last decade of public art practice, but um, will begin to be discussed in this new book that's coming out in November. 
uh, where we're tracking around 40 different projects across the world of different kinds of tendencies. And I, I think one of the things that's come out of that discussion around that book has been very much to say there is no recognizable public art practice. It's a different set of approaches that overlap, that contradict each other. But one of the things that is very clear is that during this period of time of the last decade, our understanding of public space and how we are actors within that public space has changed profoundly. This is an image for me that contains all of those contradictions, this, this and the next one. This is, um, does anybody recognize it? This is Doris Salcedo's shibboleth on the floor of Tate Modern looking down, but it's looking down at a silent disco. So you know where everybody has their own headphones and their own music. Um, and so essentially what's going on there is people primarily uh, in their own world, but collectively embracing this space as a place to enact that, um, whilst at the same time dancing on top of an artwork. <laughs> so to understand that whilst being inside a museum, so to understand the contradictions of that, uh, of what brought them there, it was a flash mob, uh, so the fact that somehow the Turbine Hall of the Tate declares itself as a public space, as a, a space to meet, to enact that, um, that moment of reverie together, and yet it's still happening in an atomized way. It's still happening inside their own heads, if you like. And at the same time, of course, a uh, public space, certainly within the last three years, we've seen, this is Gezi Park in Istanbul, is still the site of contestation, is still the site of um, capitalism encroaching on areas uh, which are apparently free, uh, which are apparently areas of the commons uh, owned by all. So questions of land ownership, of, of uh, freedom, uh, of rights to act, uh, and are still absolutely at the forefront of artists negotiating these difficult kinds of spaces. So in terms of that, that's the background against which these, art, these artists are developing their work. And yet what's deeply depressing about um, the state of public art, and this must be something that Koru here feel very keenly, is that primarily the ambition that we see from most public art commissioning, certainly in the UK and I think in Europe, is of a very low ambition. Um, whenever I walk into a new public art commissioning context, this is what most commissioners and funders have in their heads. Um, they would like there to be a Gormley. And this is nothing per se against Gormley's practice, uh, or a Jeff Koons Bill Bow effect, please, um, is that that is really uh, over a decade, 20 years ago, an understanding of how public art uh, can be used in terms of the promotion of particular cultural identities. So one of the problems that we've got, as far as I can see it, is that there's a division between artists, curators and producers in the contemporary art field and how we understand an artist's ideas to emerge as they would in a studio through risks and failures and tryings out and dreaming. And on the other hand, public art commissioning and funding, which is primarily a design and build process, which is we want something certain. We want something to make this place, not contest it. We don't want it to ask questions. We want it to give it us answers. We want it to be on the back of a postcard. We want it to be in the back of a newscaster or a broadcaster when they're giving a newscast. We want to be recognizable as this place because of this iconic statue or this iconic uh, building. And therefore, that creates a very difficult situation for artists because they're coming into a position whereby they want to ask questions. They want to create work which potentially shakes everything up. They don't want to create a situation in which they are closing those questions down. So what we end up with <laughs> is uh, giant inflatable ducks, uh, uh, celebrations, festivals, which of course create a sense of reverie. See, this is Sydney Harbour. They get a duck, we get a dog. Um, we get grommet. Uh, and I've got uh, nothing wrong with uh, 
those kinds of celebrations, those kinds of uh, you know art trails and things for families that encourage people to explore the city. But my God, we've got some incredible, vital, brilliant artists in our in our arts ecologies, and how sad that so much of that public art funding is going on either just embellishments or this kind of project that uh, doesn't allow for one's imagination to take flight. So that was the reason for producing this little booklet, um, which is a set of provocations, really, uh, called The New Rules of Public Art. And it's a, a set of, uh, of, of rules or provocations that comes from that decade's worth of commissioning. The questions that I'm so often asked, and our, our producers are so often asked by funders and commissioners, around, for example, permanence. Well, we need it to be permanent, the value that's placed on permanency and what that means without questioning perhaps what permanent might mean. Are we talking 15 years? Are we talking a lifetime? Are we talking 100 years? Secondly, uh, where it is and will it stay the same? So this question of stability, that somehow value should reside in a set of materials uh, rather than perhaps a set of encounters or a set of uh, different events that might go on. So I want to just talk you through um, three of those rules, just to touch on for the, uh, the second half of, of this talk. Um, and by doing so, I, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just touch on some of the situations projects because it might give you a sense a little bit of how we've seen some of those things come together. So rule number two was um, it's not forever, and essentially that provocation is around uh, what we mean by permanence. And I'm, I think about five, six years ago, I was um, of the mind that um, temporary works allowed artists the greatest amount of freedom, hence why you see, I think, this emphasis on biennales and exhibitions, because it allows artists uh, the possibility of testing things out without needing to uh, create works that, that have the kind of materials that enable them to be on site permanently. But actually, I think the question comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is that it's about time. It's not about them being temporary, but it's about either you could have a temporary intervention or you could have a work that lasts for a very long time and changes over that time. So it's about a better understanding of time rather than temporary versus permanent. Does that make sense? So. Um, I, I wanted just to flag up this work um, for me was, you know, sometimes in your work and in your career and your practice, there are works for you where there's a sort of trigger. And Heather and Ivan Morrison um, are working in Oslo on Slow Space Program. And I worked with them for the first time in 2006, and it's been a, an absolute pleasure and a series of encounters that we've had over a number of commissions. This was an intervention over 24 hours in the center of Bristol where there was a staged lorry crash which was highly stylized with this 25,000 flowers across the city being spread. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. And the interesting thing about this work and how it then led to this series of temporary interventions is that what I noticed happened with this work was that it did not remain the same throughout the day. So it responded to the nature of the 24-hour period. So it began as a very stylized sculptural intervention. And by the end of the day, uh, this queue of people had formed who then pounced on the flowers, which were then taken and dispersed all the way across the city. The most amazing sights of people stuffing flowers into their children's buggies and taking them home. And it turned into this extraordinary participatory process where then the work was dispersed. So it immediately, for me, held those things of, well, where's the work? Where has it occurred? And it was a story. It became this urban myth of the day the lorry crashed in the center of town. Now, now at the time, the funders behind this work said, it's great, such a gift to the city. You know, you're giving away all these flowers. But of course, Ivan and Heather 
understood that actually it was quite a dark work. It's essentially, it was about looting. It was about a bunch of people coming and stealing the flowers and taking them away. So there was a kind of melancholy and a darkness to it. And in fact, it's just been staged for the first time in eight years in Gorky Park in Moscow, um, which I, must have been the most incredible sight. But what it, what it did for me was then lead to this series of works called One Day Sculpture in New Zealand, which you can see on onedaysculpture.org.nz. Um, and that was a series of works that played with this kind of curatorial parameter of the 24-hour period. Now, one of the things I think is quite interesting to think about as curators, we could perhaps talk about afterwards, is that what I've tried to do is move away from a thematic framework when you're commissioning work, because I find that it... It, it really um, it holds the work too tightly um, and, and, and it can be quite restrictive for artists. So I think you have to think of a curatorial uh, framework at the beginning as a, as a catalyst for the artist to respond to that then allows the works to go in their own directions. So this was a case in point where the catalyst was an invitation to artists to create work that only lasted for 24 hours um, and that unfolded through a set of interventions from Heather and Ivan Morrison's large-scale barricade across a Wellington Street, extraordinary sculptural installation, through to Lara L. Murphy's, um cataloguing and indexing of the histories of these houses that had been brought together in this amazing house, boat, uh, sort of house yard to be sold, but they were from all different places across the country. So there was this sort of, it was really in this piece um, that went in the newspaper that day, her one day sculpture, traced the history of New Zealand through these, through these houses. Through to Her Thomas Hirshhorn, who was here of course, um, his fantastic uh, temporary intervention, which kind of uh, mirrored the ways in which, uh, this was called his poor racer, the cars were sort of pimped up along the esplanade in Christchurch. Uh, and he sat with the car over 24 hours and had these amazing different conversations. You'll know from when he was here, he's like such a charming man. And, uh, and absolutely created something that he understood that place. So one of the other interesting things to emerge through public art commissioning is how do you get under the skin of a place when you're not from there? So often, it, one of the rules is, is to think about the nature of being an outsider. So one of the questions to me often when commissioning work in Oslo is, well, why are you here? Why isn't a Norwegian curator commissioning in Oslo? And I think one of the things that Anna Beata and I have talked about a lot is what can you bring as an outsider? How can you see a place, help see a place anew, afresh? And I think that's what artists do when they're not from a place. But if you can create some dialogue between both Oslo residents and artists and curators coming from the outside, then you get something really interesting happening. Another work, um, to g just to give you a quick indication of one day sculpture, was a work by Superflex where they contracted everyone who worked for the ANZ bank not to say the word dollars for 24 hours. So this idea of uh, intervention which would, could act like kind of butterfly wings across one side of the earth to the other. Um, Subsequently, the recession did happen, so you never know. Maybe, maybe Superflex were responsible <laughs> for it. Um, but I was quite interested in how economic interventions might then potentially uh, unfold. But these are very, um, very, those are highly, highly ephemeral works. And I guess that the, the closest in regards to Bjervika would be uh, the series called Common Lands, which was part of Bjervika's uh, temporary program, temporary art program. Now, when I first, um, if you can imagine, so my background, therefore, was these series of temporary commissions. We'd done one or two other pub permanent public art commissions, and I was contacted um, to come and write a curatorial vision for the public art program for Bjovica. And at the time, uh, there was a very interesting approach there, which was, first of all, there was a very interesting art yearbook, uh, the, uh, the sort of art manual which was written, uh, which was about looking at the types of public art that could be commissioned. Secondly, um, support for the Kunsthal Oslo as an ongoing uh, art institution. And then the temporary art program, which included this, uh, flying this balloon which said, one fine day, all this can be yours. So a set of interventions that were questioning the nature of common lands. 
So within that, then to try and devise to think about a progressive kind of permanent public art program is really challenging. And going back to that, you know, that phone call you get on Sunday morning, it was a little bit like that because you so often start with this image. Those of you who are involved in commissioning, you always start with a master plan, don't you? You always start with a bird's eye view. And I, I was kind of thinking, you know, this is an enormous area. And although the budget was good, as ever on these kinds of projects, it would be microscopic in regards to trying to have some sort of impact in that area. And I think initially there was an idea there might be a set of um, some sculptural installations. But what really struck me, of course, was the way in which the Opera House had become the Opera House roof specifically, had become a social space. I was really intrigued by the fact that what the architects had seemed to understand was the way in which the city slowed down at that point. That it slowed down to a point, it became a space for people to think and to, to be. I watched people protest on there, I watched people do Tai Chi on there. Uh, I was very interested in the fact that there was a high-end art performances happening underneath yet there seemed to be this uh, commercial, free, democratic space above. And I started to think about maybe there was a way to think about creating a set of projects that would question the nature of slowness in this city. Um, and so I wrote a, a strategy, but as I've said before, what I was really interested in doing is that being a catalyst, not something that would hold the artist's ideas too tightly, but act as a series of inspirations. So I was really interested in things like um, Agnes Dennis's wheat field in New York in the 70s. I was very interested in how there had been an emergence of pavilions um, as spaces for gathering and exchange. I was really inspired by Amy Franceschini's uh, Victory Gardens in San Francisco and the emergence of food production and alternative radical food production as a means of artists intervening in public space. So all of those things began to help me to think about how we might think about this space, which was undergoing profound change. And there you know, was another temporary art uh, intervention happening in its midst. The odd thing when you're, when you're starting to work on these kinds of projects is, of course, unforeseen changes happen. So this is an ongoing 15-year development. So this was in 2010, we're now in 2014, so there have been all sorts of changes in that area. But just two weeks before um, all of the artists and I met in 2011 for five days, uh, was uh, the, the bomb went off and there was the Terrorism Act here in Oslo, which then again profoundly changed an understanding of what it meant as an artist to come and think about the nature of public space, the future, how we, re how we think about the future of this city and the people within it and how they respond to each other. One of the most profound works, self-made works of public art to me is this newsstand, which uh, of course everybody here knows, which was left, for those who watching the live stream, uh, left by the bomb. Um, suffered uh, the uh, effects of the bomb, but the, uh, the inner glass is still intact, and it retains within it the daily newspaper, with, of course, the news from the day before. So time, in that sense, is frozen in that moment. So how could we possibly make works which would somehow uh, create a, a new thinking around the future of this city and Bjervika as a space? We held a series of um, discussions. We banned PowerPoint, pleased to hear. If it was, if, if it was uh, a day like today, we'd be on a boat or out in the forest having this discussion. Um, and one of the first propositions that, uh, that emerged from that, and I'm just going to talk about two of the projects very, very quickly, um, was the Future Farmers' uh, brilliant proposition of flatbread society and a bakehouse for Bjervika. Now, it's still in progress. We're still at the point where we're working together with a number of groups. But what this project has shown me and I've, I've really learned from has been the need to invest time in building a network of people who then create ownership for a project over time. So this project really began in 2011, 2012. So we're now some way on 
um, from a series of interventions, discussions, gatherings, behind making a, a public bakehouse and an area, a grain field that's dedicated to ancient grains right on the waterfront. And what does that mean? How will it run? What, how do we prevent it becoming just a public barbecue? All of these questions have been in our minds. It's been developed. Delightful picture of Anabiata here. Um, so this, as uh, many of you will know, is the beginnings of Herlichten, which are the allotments underneath the towers. And this is an important thing, I think, when thinking about the future of public art commissioning, is that the allotments weren't really part of the work or intention of Future Farmers' work, but were inspired by and an offshoot of uh, that original proposition to set up Flatbread Society, which was dedicated to thinking about the nature uh, of flatbread recipes and, and the interconnecting communities across the city of Oslo. Um, it's very lovely that those two things, the allotments and the bakehouse, will probably now start to work together uh, in how we might think about that area as an area of food production and, and urban gardening for the future. But there are a lot of, uh, as we know, there's a lot of urban gardening projects that have bubbled up in the last four years. Uh, and so the question to Amy and I has been, how do you retain the artistic integrity? Nato Thompson, who's the chief curator at Creative Time in Living as Form, wrote a really interesting question about, does it matter if you try and identify where is the art? You know, when does art turn into life and life into art? Maybe the question is not how do we define this as art, but perhaps how is it affecting? What is, what is the artist's role that allows something to happen? So the types of questions and judgments I always use with this kind of work is to say, how does this change the nature of that place? How does it unsettle what we expected to happen there? And somehow it's the fact that these artists, activists, and architects have come into this space that have allowed this to happen. But there's also something in the way in which Amy and Stain and everybody else at Future Farmers work, which is around the charismatic object. Does that make sense, that word? Does that translate right, charismatic object? So this was that amazing boat oven which um, came to Oslo last year when we did Flatbread Society and the building of this temporary oven on, on the waterfront there. And the thing about this object is that uh, it's part of the project, but it's kind of eccentric, crazy. You know, what the hell is that? And it's in some ways acts almost like a Trojan horse to sort of start to gather people's interests around it. Because one of the things that's been interesting to us around Flatbread Society has been the fact that it, it, it can gather an extraordinary set of people who haven't met before. And then the question for me as a director and producer is always, so how do we then attract those people that aren't directly involved in making that project happen? And it's through extraordinary charismatic objects like that that it begins to happen. So this came up onto the waterfront and immediately attracted people to it, particularly young people who were just kind of entranced by it as, a, as, as this extraordinary kayak with this working oven within it. This was this temporary structure, and I think one of the things I was really struck by at the time was the way in which even this, this provisional structure was playing with sort of the architecture of barcode in the back and also the opera house roof as well, sort of intentionally, unintentionally. Um, it creates this sense that something else can happen there. And I think that was one of the things, reason we did it as a test, to say, yeah, what, what starts to happen? Um, Amy and Stane in particular, I think the feedback we had from the, the six weeks where they were on site was that people were coming out of the new apartments on this site and saying, we've been waiting for something to happen that's different. Um, we've been, we've, we're intrigued. So the question is now, how do we create a structure that then prolongs that, that actually where there's a sense of ownership where something can continue and unfold? And maybe it's one thing and it turns into another after a few years. There has to be that built into it as a way of working. And the other project I'm going to touch on and I'm not going to tell you too much about um, is by Katie Patterson, who I'm really delighted is here. Um, and Katie's idea similarly tests the edges and the barriers and the parameters of a public art commission for that site and questions 
really um, how we imagine our future to be. Um, I'm going to reveal a little bit because we're quite a small group, but then it's being live streamed, so we'll see. Um, in the, I'm going to give you out each one of these. And pass those around. Um, and Katie uh, has planted a thousand trees just outside of Oslo. Uh, and the trees felled, uh, the wood from those trees will be used to build a room on the top floor of the new Dijkman Library uh, in Bjørvika. Um, and this project will evolve over a hundred years' time. Whilst those trees grow in this forest, those thousand trees, each year, year on year, um, a writer will be commissioned to write a text. Uh, it could be a novel, it could be a letter, it could be a piece of non-fiction. Um, but all of those texts, year on year, for the next hundred years, will be held unread and unpublished by the City Library in this special room, in trust. And then in 2114, uh, they will be published on paper derived from the trees that are now growing over the next hundred years. So the trees will be cut down and an anthology of books printed with those texts. Now you can imagine when we first uh, proposed that work to the city and the city library, the question is, what do you see? How is this a public artwork? But of course, everybody became enchanted by this idea that actually what we were doing was creating a work which would evolve for a future generation. One of the things I loved about this work was that Katie somehow conceived of a work that is beyond all of our lifetimes. Maybe only Ruby sitting there, who's 11, uh, might possibly <laughs> get there. If you don't drink and don't smoke, don't take drugs. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think this idea of a work that is beyond our lifetime uh, really in encourages us to think about what that gift is of a work for the future. Maybe that is real permanence beyond our lifetime. But of course what it also does in the present is to act as a conceptual work which uh, really entreats you to think about what you would write for a future generation. What would you tell someone about 100 years time? But as a work, it also includes this idea of duration. So it also includes this idea of in 50 years time, the writer who gives their work, their text to be held by the library will still be alive when it's eventually printed. So inbuilt within the work itself as a mechanism is that it will change. It will change for the very participants involved within it, just as with Bakehouse Bjervica, that will change fundamentally from who is involved. So it recognizes that place isn't a static, stable thing. You can't commission a work and have an understanding that the city will stay the same around it. It will change, as we do, over generation and generation. And what these works do, I think, is respond to the fact that the world will change around them. So they create a mechanism that allows that to happen instead of perhaps a rotting iron uh, sculpture which ultimately becomes decommissioned over time. So just quickly into, into a couple of other rules just to sort of give a sense of how, how some of those ideas uh, come about. The other thing I'm, I'm very interested in is how these works create a community or a constituency rather than target one. So often in public art commissioning is an idea that you go in, usually to a, a sort of identified, deprived community and somehow uh, create a solution uh, for that uh, area of low engagement. But of course works like Flatbread Society create a temporary community. It was Brian Eno who said perhaps the most important thing of a work of art uh, is to create a temporary community. Uh, around it and uh, there's an understanding of how that happens whether that be through food production, baking, sharing of food, uh, whether that be through activism, uh, whether that be through the dreaming of a new nation. Uh, in the case of Nowhere Island we had 23,000 citizens from 135 countries coming together for that project and so there was a sense in which 
someone out there in South Sudan is a nowhere island citizen, just as someone watching in the Isle of Skye is today. But of course, you know, the, the, the tricky thing for us as producers is to create a space that protects the artists. So curating is not simply about the logistics of making these things happen or getting under the skin of a place and creating opportunities for people to become engaged, but it's also protecting the artist from this kind of thing. So whilst all of that wonderful work was going on with Nowhere Island, we were uh, in the Sun, British tabloid, uh, who have a reaction to contemporary art. We know that contemporary art is like the sort of you know, itch that tabloids want to scratch, certainly in Britain anyway. And uh, the knee-jerk reaction is, uh, in this case, half a million pounds for a chunk of rock. And so the question is how, as producers and curators, we can create a place for an artist to be free uh, as much as they possibly can. And that might be uh, that we have to get really good at communications campaigns around particular projects that we can spot uh, when the media is going to pick up on a particular part of the work and not allow people to speak for the work. One of the things I've really discovered is that one of the most difficult things is to launch a work before it exists in real time and people are participating. So I would really, really say to anyone out there that's commissioning public art, don't, don't publish a computer-generated image of what an artwork is going to look like before it exists because it will be judged and it will be on trial before people are genuinely engaging with it as an artwork. Um, it needs to exist as an idea, not as a computer-generated image. Um, I'll just flip through these. And the other thing I would say is that I think curators and producers and commissioners have to get really good now at thinking about the use of digital media. One of the best things that's happened to us the situations, because we don't have a building, is the possibilities of digital media can bring and the ways in which people can engage with the work. So you can be standing, uh, encountering a public artwork, and you can, you can download an artist talking about that work on your phone. You can uh, uh, find ways of discovering and exploring uh, an artwork through uh, an adjacent website. And it can be a brilliant, brilliant way of really going in deep and that comes to rule number six, your favorite, demand more than fireworks. So one of the things that's very difficult when you're a producer, let's say, of something like a festival or maybe permanent public artworks, is you're, you're um, often asked by cities and municipalities to deliver something which is going to be quite spectacular, which is going to uh, be uh, engaging on a, on a very sort of superficial level. So the question is here, here's two young people contributing to the Nowhere Island Constitution, uh, is how do you create a depth of engagement beyond that kind of initial wow factor? So how do you get from the charismatic object and that kind of immediate sense of excitement of seeing something bizarre and unusual to a real engagement with critical thinking and ideas? Well, one of the ways we did it for Nowhere Island was that uh, a, a series of... Um, uh, constitutional propositions. So if you were going to become a uh, citizen of a new nation, how would you, what proposal would you make for the constitution? There were 2,700 propositions and we used kind of Facebook ranking as a kind of test to try and rank those propositions in order. But we've also started to use other voices that come in and that can be a really interesting way of opening up the ideas of an artist. I don't think artists always have to somehow explain away their projects. The work does that for them. But what the public might need, or what a range of different kind of communities might need, is perhaps ways into the work through their own interests. And we've often found that sometimes contemporary art can feel very unfamiliar, very elitist, very difficult to get your head around. And sometimes having someone who comes from a different kind of sector or a different industry talking about that work can open up suddenly the work. We found that with Noah Island, where we had 52 resident thinkers part of that project over one year. So every week, there was a new resident thinker of that project. And they came from all sorts of different kinds of disciplines, from environmentalism, from activism, through to disability rights, animators, actors, broadcasters, even Vidal Sassoon, God bless him, hairdresser, <laughs> talking about his background as a migrant. 
uh, brilliant geographer, Doreen Massey, poet Selena Godden, you know, all these different voices with very different opinions about what they felt Noah Island was about. But it was a way we found of them getting people involved in the project. Um, Suzanne Lacey, who uh, is um, a, fan a wonderful artist, said she never saw No Island, but she talked about it being a work which, uh, that it was a, a powerful way of seeing. And she talked about that symbolic gesture that it perhaps then encouraged people to act in another powerful way. Um, I want to play for you um, very briefly a, a piece by one of the resident thinkers, Tim Etchells. Um, Tim, uh, as you might know, is the director of Forced Entertainment Performance Group. And this is an example of how many art students, who, when I show them pictures of Nowhere Island, they get very antsy. And they use, they've said things to me like, there's an awful lot of people in your photographs. And I said, well, that's because you're used to taking photographs in galleries where there isn't anybody there. Um, but I think people get very nervous that there's a certain sort of reverie and populism around public art, and that somehow that diminishes its integrity and its depth and its criticality. Well, Tim's piece I'm going to show you is an example of how not to lose that, that you can have reverie, but at the same time, something where there's a certain kind of criticality to it. I'm just going to play that. ...of Nowhere Island. As we stop in the shelter of the doorway in the thunderstorm, S holds out his hand to check the rain, the hand, the flatness of it, the openness, the question of it, the directness, the simplicity, the pragmatism, the straightforwardness, the sunshine, and maybe just the repetition of this gesture, which must be as old as the hills, or as old as the co-presence of hands and rain. Just a few thoughts concerning the island. Please let it not be that utopia with doves and waterfalls and soft white clothes and doors that open as soon as they're approached. And please let it not be that utopia with all in harmony and accord. And please not that utopia of agrarian fantasy with all of us in touch with, or at peace with the land, working the land together, or weaving together in some endlessly temperate and agreeable climate, caught in simple pleasures, eating simple, wholesome food. And please, just as strongly, please, not that techno-utopia where no one works at all since the machines, ever more clever and more skilled, more resourceful, are doing everything hidden in basements, miniaturized or concealed behind the walls. And please, not that morbid utopia that so many churches speak of or hope for or promise, but only come the day, meaning after death. And not that utopia of absolute freedom, or that of total equality, or that, f that of flattening creeds, races, genders, and all that into one single humanity or brotherhood, and not that utopia of original ignorance, Adam and Eve, the nakedness that is not nakedness, no thank you, and not that utopia of free love, or boundless and open desire, or that hallucinatory psychedelic utopia of the human dissolved into the universe, and not that utopia of the virtual with its useless pretended transcendence of flesh and biology. And again, please, not that utopia of endless oneness and endless accord, not likely peace or everlasting peace, not likely peace at all, and not the satisfaction of all desires and not the exhaustion of all need, and please not an end to difference, no to the utopia determined by sense. No to the utopia determined by utility. No to the utopias of knowledge, understanding and progress. Please, not the uniformity of consent or that of placidity. No to the erasure of anger. Please not the utopic reduction of human space to that of a prison in which all needs have been anticipated, prescribed 
or provided for, please not the reduction of everything to the realm of the solvable. Please not some temperate climate of banality, cotton wooled and perpetuated ad nauseum. Not late capitalist laissez-faire bliss. Not communistic brotherhood. Not either theocratic order or rationalist decency. Not some medicalized or genetically modified utopia in which all personalities and physicalities have been balanced, remixed and extended forever in a calculation of chemicals and genes. Please not the utopia of the old and wise, and please, not that utopia of the young and the carefree, please, not men and women in accord with each other in all possible combinations, or mankind so-called at accord once again with the animals so-called. No, not equality, not comfort, not acceptance, not even tolerance, we'll have none of it. A utopia of dispute might be better a utopia of permanent contestation, anger, and the unruly. But not even these will satisfy. Let's have instead the utopia which resists all names, refuses all belonging, refuses all place, definition, or affiliation, i.e. not for us, that which can be dreamed or imagined, described or spoken of, and not for us anything that can be caught in the noose of 26 letters called an alphabet and hanged. Not for us what is offered, not for us what is given, not for us what is promised, not for us what is even possible. Not that, not anything of it, but everything, everything which is other than that. Friends, fellow citizens, acquaintances, enemies. I look forward to our eventual meeting and to your full adoption of these, my most reasonable demands. Okay, thank you for the indulgence of showing that to you, but it's just so brilliant. Um, I think what, what Tim's uh, response to Noah Ireland shows is the possibility of uh, commissioning work that then enables other creative responses, just as Katie's Future Library will do. And that becomes an incredibly exciting prospect, that things aren't contained within a single form, but they explode uh, and uh, therefore allow other kind of creative responses. I think, to finish, one of the things that I'm really keen to do is to work with other producers internationally. And we've Coru and I are part of something called the European Network of Public Art Producers to write, really change the adoption associations of how the types of public art should be commissioned. Uh, this was a recent um, project in Bristol, a water slide created by uh, an artist uh, called Luke Jerram, which went down a very steep street in Bristol. Very popular, 60,000 people turned out, see it, marvellous. Uh, they all had a good day. And at the same time, at the bottom of that street, there was this crowd who were listening to a work produced by Claire Feely here um, by an artist called Annie Kakars, which was a, a, a concert played by a pianist to a series of caged songbirds. Absolutely incredible, beautiful, beautiful work. Very, very quiet and silent and created this space for thinking. I guess my question, without casting aspersions on on either of those works really, is around what do we do as artists and commissioners and curators to add another layer into our cities? And sometimes that might not mean uh, creating something that is expected or true. And one of the rules that we talk about is perhaps our public artworks don't tell the truth. Uh, we commissioned a mobile app, for example, uh, which is a series of stories that unfold in response to GPS whilst walking across the city. And I think some of those questions of how fiction uh, and the creation of layers across the city uh, might be another way in which we ask artists to respond. This is actually a, a work by Tim Etchells, who you just saw, um, with this series of etched phrases uh, into the glass of a bus, of, of a bus shelter on, on uh, looking out over this beach, and it conjures up this beautiful summer's, summer's day. I think to that extent, I would say that, so what's the summary of, of some of the things that I've said? How do we create space for artists to challenge our expectations from the very beginning? 
let's give time to their process and time to the unfolding of things for the cul-de-sacs and mistakes that we would allow for in the studio. At the same time, we have to get better and much more skilled at negotiating of really uh, showing the examples of what's possible and the responses that we may have, that actually highly temporary intervention may have just a greater resonance as a permanent embellishment in our cities. We have to get our producers much, much more skilled up in negotiating in, in areas of development, of capital development, of planning, for example. We have to get artists involved in planning at a much, much earlier stage. But we also have to be ready to commit funding, the public art funding, over a long period of time. For Future Library, for example, that public art funding has gone into a trust in order, to, in order for that work to happen over a long period of time. So some of our very basic policies, policies and the legalities over how we commission public art have to change. But we've also got to allow for those ephemeral risk-taking interventions that by young artists, we don't know where they're going to go. Um, this was a proposition for a 10-second residence uh, by the young artist in Bristol. And uh, in, as part of what Situations does, uh, we are commissioning a series of works called The New Situationists. Uh, artists that I see coming through art schools now are increasingly creating work for the market. You go around any degree show currently and you see work that is ready for the gallery system. How do we encourage younger artists to create work for the public realm when it seems so fraught with negotiation? We have to create a situation in which they see that as a space for incredible uh, dreaming of dreams in response to certain situations. So uh, perhaps forever might be uh, our lifetime or it might be beyond our lifetime, but I think the shaking up of public time as well as public space is perhaps the future of public art producing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. A visible object is huge. Mm. Uh, people will see it from all angles. Mm. Is it possible to make very small, subtle objects that are aesthetic pleasing, I would say, mm. or seduce? Mm. But, uh, I mean, if you have such a small object, how can you make it mm. the object of this attraction? Yeah, how can course. you make it yeah. talk about? Because I found again and again that in the public area there is a lot of were made by men that know how to sell <laughs> ideas and how to yeah. muscle things around. Yeah. So yeah. what about the very delicate small objects? Yeah. How can, what can we do with those? Well, I, I guess the question is, what's your purpose you know, as an artist? So there's room for quiet, subtle, viral interventions. But the thing with public space is that you're competing against the world, yeah? Uh -huh. You're competing yeah. against everything else, the design of a chair or a door or, uh, you know, beautiful um, graphic print. So the, the, the question is, if it's your purpose for that object to be noticed, then there has to be something in its, either in its, in, in its qualities that it, that it becomes noticed. Or if you're, if you're, there's plenty of examples of interventions, quiet interventions. There's a wonderful work where an artist goes around mending things, I don't know if you know about his work, Leon Kessner, Leon Kessner, I think his work is, and he goes around mending, you know, chairs that don't stay up straight, and, you know, and they're, they're, they're totally hidden, so as a practice, it's not important that you notice that, it's conceptually important, so then it becomes the documentation, becomes the work, essentially, the documentation and an understanding of him going around mending everything becomes important conceptually. So I would say if the, it, it, the question is, 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 is around how that work functions, 
because I find it very difficult. For example, I come from Colombia, and the city where I live, Medellin, is extremely busy and noisy yeah. and impossible to to do anything that is actually noticed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and then if you don't have the first engagement with the public, how can you make it something that goes beyond the, the five people that you have around? How how do you actually engage people that are not interested mm. in art. Mm. Mm. How do I place those questions out there? Mm -hmm. How how do I do not become didactic yeah. about those questions? Yeah, because let's say if it's an object uh, to that has existential questions for yeah. to say something. <laughs> so just the nature of the object means that I cannot go and make those questions. Mm -hmm. I have to let people discover. Mm -hmm. And I how create how to create that little space for to exist in the public space. Mm -hmm. I, um, well, that, I, I guess the question is, it would come back to your motivation for me, I and mean, probably there's artists in the audience who could answer that much better than I could, but I, my, my gut feeling there would be to say, what's your motivation? So there are some artists who might have a practice which is, you, you couldn't distinguish it from everyday life, okay? So they might set up a, a stall, you know, and, and be exchanging goods, and that's their practice. But it doesn't matter to them that someone might know it as art or not. Okay. So my question would be uh, back to you: Is that what's your motivation? Is it important for someone to know that you're an artist and that it's yes, artwork? It's absolutely. In it's which case, then it's about thinking: Well, what what doesn't belong here? You know, what 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 would stand out? What would then get people's attention as this not belonging here somehow? Because uh, I think it depends. You know, if you're interested in infiltrating. Say the the superflex piece, you know, with yeah. the with the bank, you know, people coming in to do their banking that day didn't know that the staff had signed a contract, not to say the word dollars, you know. So it's actually very important that you didn't notice anything, which was quite funny because the bank staff wanted to put up balloons to celebrate the fact that the bank was an artwork that day. <laughs> we had to say no, take them down. The point is, you know, so it's there's some interesting questions there about that. You know that question, but I I, I think it, it's so individual. You know, according to Narcissus, like I think in that sense, Future Farmers' work would look very very different to Fernando Garcia Dori or or to Jana Van Heeswijk or other people that are, might be working within the same tone or approach, but will have a completely different set of aesthetics around it. You know, that pertains to each artist. So it's kind of figuring out what is your I guess the, the, the most efficient thing that I have seen around is the example of street art, street art and mm -hmm. how they build communities and yeah. how they actually put out there very small things but they have Instagram or they have Facebook and mm -hmm. creating communities around that one by one that's kind of the closest yeah. thing I have uh, Yeah um, I was thinking about um, the new rules of public art. Um, you know, every time when we are making uh, some kind of art production, we are thinking about who to make it for. Mm. And uh, uh, I see, and also you, you are of course uh, very aware of uh, these rules are being uh, polemic, they are provocative, in yeah. a way, uh, and very inspiring uh, for uh, you know for us working in commissions and mm. that we always, you know, meet this, um, in a way, a uh, certain prejudice against mm. public art, what mm. public art needs to be. But also I was, uh, uh, so if this book, is it for, you know, the art professionals or is it for the, uh, the people who are going to live around it? Is it for the community, the local community? Is it mm. for the the workers who are, you know, in a working space, wherever mm. they, uh, yeah, where they work every day. Uh, because if it was for the art community, if it was yeah. for me, I would say, okay, it doesn't have to look like public art, but can it? Mm. Couldn't you also say, uh, it doesn't have to look like uh, public art, but it can yeah. look like it. Or yeah. it doesn't have to be for, a, but it can be for, yeah. a, you know, all yeah, this. Yeah. That's it, that is, um, in a way, um, relevant to what you said about you know the new orientation within contemporary mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. that
that it's not about you know this gap between the relational projects on the one hand and no. this more permanent and yeah. you know object oriented uh, work on the other hand. Mm -hmm. It's not this gap. Mm -hmm. you now you have very critical, interesting, you know, in a in a way a neo materialism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Going on in the uh, contemporary art uh, uh, sector, at least after the last documenta you saw that, and mm -hmm. also in Norway you, you have, for example, very um, artists who are very someone sitting here, Marianne Heyer, Terry <laughs> Nikolaisen, yeah. uh, who worked, you know, have this spec speci uh, specific uh, uh, sensitivity mm -hmm. against this. So mm -hmm. it's not this. One no. or the other. Mm. Would you agree? On yeah, that? I would agree. I mean, I think it's a discussion document, you know. It's yeah. kind of, I don't really know exactly who it's for. Um, I think it's, it's certainly not written as really as a rule book to follow, you know. Or I don't think that, uh, I think one of the things we've talked about as a team back at, in Bristol has been that uh, I'm certainly not, we're not certainly proposing that uh, public art has to be one thing. But I think what we recognize is there's a need. There's, there's a problem. There is a problem there, which is that there's a schism between the contemporary art professional world and the gallery world and the kind of work that's produced in public art. And there's a set of frustrations that artists encounter. And I think it's getting better, but I think that there are actually, there's more that we could do when we speak from experience. So after sort of 15, 20 years of commissioning this kind of work, I think it's about saying, actually, um, we need to challenge some of the, the conventions and the status quo and the ways in what artists are asked to do as service providers. Um, and particularly, the reason we've done it now is because uh, mostly in the rest of Europe, the impact of the recession, and certainly in North America, has been that money for the arts is substantially cut whereas money for public art is going up. Because as, as we, we're in recovery somewhat, there's a renewed set of funding for, for public art as part of redevelopment. So the question is how can we better use that money so that we might support a new generation of artists working in the public realm? So the, the, the question in my mind is that exactly what you just said there, which is that if it proves to be helpful as a, some sort of tool as a discussion, to have a discussion, then it's doing its job. But um, there, are, there are so many things in there that are contradictory in a sense, you know. So I think, it, I'm hoping that's what it'll do, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a really inspiring and wonderful lecture. And I wanted, I think it's interesting what you're saying now as well, that the cuts are, um, they're cutting in the, well, the finances for art mm. are being cut, while the finances for public art yeah. are growing. And I was thinking this is also kind of alarming, because it is, I think, due to the fact that public art has a different interface with the public, so it's potentially easy to instrumentalize. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, too, what, if you, what you think about the need for protecting art and protecting its critical function. Mm. Um, because I think this is quite obvious, even in the Definitely. whole idea of yeah. separating public art from art. Yeah. What does that mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Could you say something about this? Because I feel yeah. also, when we discuss Björvika, this is an issue, really. Absolutely. And I know you think about that, yeah, so it would be interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, do you dance with the devil or not? <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Björvika is, is not the devil in that sense, you know, I think that, that it's a public-private partnership. So one of the things that was very interesting when we did Slow Days is that this perception that uh, private development, you know, that, that, that artists should stay away, you know, and not become involved in that. And I think that there are moral questions to ask ourselves around uh, developments that involve uh, the removal of certain communities and people from one area and you know, other sort of, um, should we say, capitalist kind of concerns coming into those areas. In this case of Björvika, it's really complex because there was no existing community there. So it, it, it has a, you know, it's a post-industrial area, but there is a question over what is being built there and how, what is being promised of that space. My 
personal view on that is that I can think of no better people to bring into that conversation than artists. And so I think if we can create a space where artists are having a say or questioning in some way what might be produced there in a productive way, then that gets really exciting. It's not easy, and there's probably lots of failures along the way in terms of what, we might, what might be possible. But I think that the fact that artists have been part of the conversation and the city has allowed us to have a, a really prominent voice within that has been really exciting and really productive. Um, but I would say that what I have seen a lot of is that um, I saw it a lot with the Olympics, the Olympic Park, where artists were creating works which are sort of poking a stick at the Olympics, the Olympic Park, rather than perhaps being right involved there and creating something in the midst of it. So what I'm interested in is, uh, perhaps I'm a, a diehard feminist, you know, that you work from within to change things, and maybe that that's where change is possible, rather than critiquing from, from the outside. Um, but I'm a certain optimist in that regard, that maybe we can find some cracks there where, you know, what was intended for a waterfront development might change as a result of artists being involved, or what was imagined for, for the city library might change as a result. So I, 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 I'm interested in that, but I, I don't think in any way it's, it's, it's fraught with problems and difficulties, but I think that, that that can be really exciting if we can start to get involved. But I, I think it needs artists involved in different ways, and I think, I think it also, um, the other thing about slow space that's been very interesting is that there are lots of different kinds of artist practice involved in that program. So it means that actually what you have is very different approaches, some which are more standalone projects, others which are much more integrated within the city. So that's been quite interesting, is it's not an orthodox approach across the whole program. So that's been quite interesting to watch. Yeah. I just have a quick time. question. Yeah. Uh, Rizal, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, you've brought up sort of questions of longevity and obviously access is part of that. And as some of the projects you've sort of mentioned, the use of social media and communication networks. So I'm just sort of interested um, in what happens to the documentation of the, these projects. Mm -hmm. How are they, how is that being kept? Is that something that's accessible or is that sort of become its own different morphology of the project. Um, yeah. Just because that sort of becomes a different definition of futurity and longevity in itself. So it's yeah, I mean, it's changing as as we speak. You know, I think one of the things someone said to me yesterday is that you know, my daughter's generation won't be Facebook generation, they're going to be instant messaging generation. So they won't set up Facebook profiles and all that, but they'll just have this kind of you know set of images like this. So. You know that, in terms of thinking about the documentation of project and where that re where that resides, you know it'll reside up here on the cloud, not on a single website. So I think one of the things we're trying to do is, at the moment, there's a for slow sp for Biovica, there's a there's a website that holds the whole program, but then quite a few of the projects have their own websites, and that enables them to have their own identity. So Future Library has its own uh, holding website at the moment. Flat Flatbread Society has its own website that creates enables it to use its own communication methods um, and document sort of its own there. We have a, a filmmaker, Nathan Hughes, who's coming involved in the project. He's going to be making a series of interviews around the project. We have other research students who are also involved. So there's lots of kind of different ways in which the pro program in its way is being documented. In other projects, some of the things we've started to look at are ways of um, I hate to use the term, but evaluating the project. So that might be in interviewing participants of how you get feedback. And there's some very, very interesting new apps that are around that can kind of capture some of the responses and ideas that emerge as a result. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a massive part now of producing this kind of work, partly because, you know, it, it, it exists for a remote audience, as we can see, you know, being <laughs> live streamed here. So, uh, slow space exists both for Oslo resi residents, but in a completely different way from uh, somebody watch looking at that program in Tokyo. I mean, we've had, you know, we had a visitor here in Oslo from Tasmania who'd heard about the project, who came to see what we were doing here in Oslo. You know, so there's a kind of bizarre connection of, of projects and ideas. But I guess my question is, how do you open up 
the implications, the critical implications of the work, as well as just document, choose images that kind of show it in its best light. And some of the ways we're doing that is to commission writers. So um, there's outside, there's a, the first slow space bulletin that was produced last year, so that's got an interview with Amy and I in it and an essay by Tara McDowell, and that's about sort of opening up that project as well. Hi. Um, a couple of questions. One is, so having coordinated a number of projects over a number of years, I wonder if you can, you know, looking back on a series of projects, can actually sort of glean something about the places that these projects happen. So there will, so a certain city's willingness to engage or willing mm -hmm. to be impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also wonder, you know, sort of a playful question when you, you know, lay down, you know, bed at night and you think, what was my dream? You know, do you dream that there's instead of one, two, three, four projects a year in a certain city that there would be, you know, a hundred projects? Like what is there a, I'm wondering about the relationship between sort of like a sense of community or sense of structure and, and uh, you know, like how, you know, the, you know, Katie Patterson's project and relying on sort of a pre-existing institution but setting itself up as an institution yeah. in terms of scale as well and, you know, do you imagine a city that is, you know, uh, you know, 75% of its resources and energies, attentions is mm -hmm. sort of governed by or directed to, or maybe it's not a playful question, maybe it's a serious oh, question. That's a great question. Um, I feel like we all need to go and have dinner or something and talk about that, it'd be amazing. Um, I mean, very briefly, the only way I can really answer that is maybe through my hometown, which is Bristol. So Bristol feels to me like the test bed for us um, in that, because it's where we're based, it's where my family are, where we have roots. Um, I probably have a better sense there of any of the other places that we're working of um, how the ecology works. It's, it's a similar size population to Oslo, it's half a million, so it's, but it's much smaller. And I, I think what I'm interested in beginning to see is how you might have um, a breadth of, of different kinds of encounter. So there we've commissioned permanent static public artworks. We've We've acted as the producer of a visual arts festival over a weekend. We're commissioning perform one-off performances, one-to-one -one encounters. So what's really exciting about there is to see how theatre and visual arts and music and the kind of new developments of the city are kind of all integrating. There's a really brilliant public art officer there who's just sort of trying to do exactly what we were just saying, kind of you know, really push the public art funding towards the existing arts organisations. So I guess my dream is where there's a possibility to say, um, rather than a brief coming to us with a set of parameters of what we're supposed to commission a work to do, that someone says, we really like what you do, you know, choose to work with this artist or that artist. It's where you've got a degree of freedom, and it's a little bit like what's happened next year. We're working with the artist Theaster Gates. And that's going to be part of the Bristol 2015 cultural program. So Bristol's been chosen as European green capital. Um, and, but what was exciting there was that there's some brilliant people in the city who said to us, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I really like to work with Theaster Gates, please. And they said, well, that's all about kind of how you grow a city, isn't it? <laughs> and, um, and so we put in a bid, you know, to do that. So as opposed to them saying, we'd like you to commission a work, please, around sustainability and recycling. So it, it, I guess it, it's about spotting opportunities where there's that vision. And similarly, we're doing a festival in the southwest of England at the moment, which is just beginning with a single story that we want to tell across the landscape. And we don't know how that's going to emerge at the moment. But that gets incredibly exciting, similarly to the conversations I have with Katie and Future Farmers, where you, you, you might have you know, the edges of something that we want to create work that opens out the nature of what it means to live and work in Bjorvika and, and how that resonates as a place for the city of Oslo. But beyond that, wow, you know, you can really kind of take those words. So yes, Oslo is very, very unusual. And, you know, I think the way in which the city and the developers have responded here and understand artists is phenomenal. And I'm sure that's a lot to do with Koru's influence here. Um, there's been other places where, you know, it's fighting tooth and nail to just kind of you know, try and create a bit of space for the artist. So, um, yeah, I, th I think it, I think it is about where there's a just as you were saying, Trude. I think there's a there's a there's a sense where there's a different kinds of approaches going on. It's not all one um, tone or one form of work that's being produced. 
that it creates a kind of richness of experience. Really. Yeah. I happen to have the mic, and I was hoping That's to right. follow up really quickly. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you were saying about us having to rethink time as an experience. Does that also apply um, now or in the future about public space, what we think public spaces, especially the virtual, um, and wondering if it's possible to truly engage a community that way, or if one can get discursive, true discursive sites through that, mm. um, and with the addition of, like, instead of just holding documentation, but as an actual, like, public project without maybe the, the reins of funding, mm. um, if you foresee where that might be going, or how, how it is um, in terms of what you do now. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think I think what's really exciting is the notion that something you, you might produce something as an artist or commission something as a producer that has the ability to change with its context. You know that, and and actually that the possibilities are really opening up now in terms of how that can happen uh, because there's a very uh, better understanding of places dynamic. Um, and I think that's because of our understanding of digital media, partly. Um, so I, th I think uh, our, our understanding of commissioning something that would remain the same, sort of single monumental work, you know, that one would revisit, will, will fundamentally change. And there's a brilliant piece, I don't know if anyone's come across the geographer, Dori Massey, she's absolutely fantastic, human geographer, and she wrote a piece quite a while ago, actually, about 20 years ago, um, she's written a book called Four Space, and there's a, a fantastic description of um, this road in London called Kilburn Hyde Road. It's a very ordinary North London road. And she describes how a traditional photographer would describe that place and its kind of architecture and its history and what you're seeing as the traces of history before you. And then she describes this amazing description of what that place really is. So on the one hand, you've got the material form and then you've got the strat of geology underneath you that is shifting below your feet that actually was once part of Antarctica and has moved so you've got millions of years worth of kind of growth underneath you and then overhead you've got a plane flying bananas from Nigeria you know and then there's a there's a sort of old sticker and a door that's from um, from the IRA you know that is now defunct and you've got all these traces and these memories and histories and people that have flown in who are immigrants, but actually then they've got visitors who are only just there for the day, you know, from Tokyo or something. And you've got all these kind of exchanges and meeting points going in. So to understand, to make a work of art for that road, for that space that would resonate, is going to be entirely different the following day. So, you know, I think that understanding of a dynamic place, how do you make work that kind of then resonates? is a really helpful one, yeah. Amy, you want to say something? Um, I have a question about the about press, and you showed the image of the oh, sun. Yeah. And I guess coming from the United States, art hardly gets any press, so to get that on a tablet seems like, wow, exciting. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just curious, um, it seems, I'm, wonder, I'm curious how you handled that, and it seems like the thing that art and public art don't want to make a distinction, but art can do is create public debate, and I'm, mm. I'm just curious. I felt there was a negative feeling about that publication, but I wonder mm. if it, if those sorts of that sort of press opens up a space for debate that wouldn't have been there, yeah, in the first place. I guess the point I was I don't think we handled it very well actually at the time, but we'd be better now, <laughs> having gone through it. We we just. Um, I, th I think the reason, the point I was trying to make was that the work didn't exist yet. So what was sort of put out there to the press was um, the story of what would be, you know. So it's a bit like that computer-generated image. This is what is going to start to appear in your neighborhood, and then you have it. So wh what's very difficult about that, and the reason I don't think we handled it um, as well as we could have done, was that... Uh, when we then had the media reaction when Over Island really did arrive, it was so much more balanced. We were so much more able to say, great, yeah, let's have a debate about it, you know. Because, look, this is what it is, and here is all this, all the various people get, getting involved. It's not about defending it necessarily, but we were much more able to then have a debate because everything was set up. But in a sense, when, that, when the tabloids um, 
publication came out, and maybe, you know, I think all, all public art curators have to wear sort of their tabloid thing as a badge of honour when they finally get it. But um, it, it didn't, it, we weren't able to open up the debate because the work didn't exist yet. You know? So it was quite difficult to then sort of say, oh, well, it's going to be this, or it's going to then... Uh,